Chapter 7 of Moon Bear Ma helped me pack up the few things I owned, my clothes, my slingshot, and Pa's new flip-flops, though they were too big for me still. She wrapped up a tin of forest honey in an oil cloth. It was the last honey Pa and Grandfather had collected from the forest. It felt like a lifetime ago. Although only two months had passed, yet now I was moving on again. There was no time for long goodbyes. Ma wrapped cotton around my wrist to keep my soul safe inside. She touched her palms against my face. Remember who you are, she said. Keep safe, Tim, Tim, and come back to us. I put my hands on hers. I wanted to stay there in the darkness of our house. I wanted to stay with Ma and Suli and May. Outside, cars revved their engines, and I heard the chief shout my name. Su Li held on to me, but Ma pushed her hand away. How could I leave? May struggled to reach me, pushing her arms through Ma's grip, but Ma held her tight. Tam! the chief yelled my name again. I couldn't move. I stood staring at Ma and Su Li and May clinging to one another. I should go, I said. Ma nodded. She blinked back her tears and smiled. I will pray that good luck finds you. I took a deep breath, packed up my bag and left, picked up my bag and left. I turned once to see Ma watching me through the door of the house. May clung to her skirt and truly screaming my name. What if something happened to them? Who would tell me? How would I know? Tam, the chief was standing beside the mom clearance van. Come on, General Chang said these men will take you to the city. I looked around, but General Chang's helicopter had gone. He and his men in suitcase had, suits had left. The chief helped me into the back of a van where I wedged myself in between a metal detector and shakes and shovels. Noi didn't show up to say goodbye. I could see him watching from the window of his house, his face half hidden in the shadow. The chief slammed the van door doors and plugged me into the darkness. I felt the van lurch and sighed along the track where we reached the highway. We picked up speed and I could hear the steady rush of air sliding against the sides and spraying water from the wheels in the wet road. It was hot and airless in the van. A wire grilled behind the seat let a little air and light through. I could see the back of the heads of the bomb men and the tomato nose. A voice called through the grilly. Are you all right back there? I shifted in my seat and I tried to push away the shovels that dug into my back. Yes, thank you, I said. I hugged my bag of belongings against my chest. I could feel the tin of the forest honey pressing against my skin. My stomach ached. I hadn't eaten all day. And I unwrapped the oil cloth and ran my fingers around the rim. Just one taste, I told myself. I'll save the rest. I lifted the lid and scooped some honey, sucking the smoky bitterness out from my fingers. I closed my eyes. I tasted the forest, the leaves, the honey. I tasted the damp earth where the bear cub had curled safe inside its den. I tasted Ma's sewing her flowered cloth and May and Suli playing in the sun bright pools from the waterfalls. I tasted Grandfather in the um, moppy field calling the bees and Pa smiling from under his wide-brimmed hat. I tasted all the things. I was glad of the darkness. I closed the tin lid and pressed it tight. I promised myself I would never open it again. Never. I would never taste it. I would never even try. I was glad of the darkness because in the darkness no one can see you cry. And because that was such a short chapter, I'll read chapter 8 too. Chapter 8. The bang of the doors woke me. Light flooded the van. I sat up and rubbed my neck. It was stiff from lying crooked up against hard boxes. The driver helped me out and dropped my bags on the ground beside me. I stood blinking in the late afternoon sunlight. Um, we were in the yard surrounded by high metal fencing topped with a roll of bob wire. Um, two logging trucks, like the ones I'd seen in the mountains, were parked up on the far side. Um, one was hitched up on its side, having a tire change. Cars with prices on their hoods were lined up against the fence facing the road. They shone um, beetle bright in the sunlight. 
Beyond the fence and the cars and the motorbikes and the Turk Turks moved in a steady stream along a wide road. The air was flooded with dusk and noise and so much noise. So this is what it was like in the city. A man in blue overalls was walking across the yard toward me. This is Mr. Stone, said the dry driver. He owns Stone Motors. He will take care of you now. Mr. Stone stood in front of me. He was a tall man, taller than our chief. His hands were black with oil. He chucked a wrench in he clutched he clutched a wrench in one of them. He looked me up and down, his eyes resting on my torn shirt and bare feet. He turned to the driver. He looks young. We were expecting someone older. The driver shrugged his shoulders. General Chang said to bring him here. Mr Sun walked in a circle around me. How old are you, boy? I stared at the ground, watching Mr. Stone's work boots come to a stop in front of me. What's your name, he said. I concentrated on my feet, where, which were caked with a layer of dirt. Tam, I said. My name is Tam. Do you have a family? I nodded. Mr. Stone turned to the driver. Then I think you should take him back. The driver ran his hand through his hair. Um, he leaned in the car, the window of the car. I could see him talking to Tomato Nose. Tomato Nose took a swig of water from a bottle and wiped his face. I felt their eyes on me. I couldn't go back however much I wanted to. I had to earn money from Ma. It was the only way I could keep the house we'd been giving. She was relying on me. I picked up my bag from the ground and slung it over my shoulder, trying to look more confident than I felt. I am here to work, I said. Mr. Stone exchanged a glance with the driver. The driver shrugged his shoulders and said something I couldn't hear. I wanted him to climb into the car and to reeve the engine. Tomato Nose gave a thumbs up and a cherry wave as they drove away in the swirl of exhaust, exhaust and dust. Mr. Stone looked, watched them go and then turned to me. Follow me, he growled. I walked close behind him, close to the garden, across the gar- Wow. I walked close behind him, across the yard, into the darkness of the garage, and almost tripped over a pair of legs sticking out from under a car. My eldest, Rami, Mr. Stone, steering ahead, he worked for me. I glanced back but could only hear the chuck of metal on metal underneath the car. I had to run to keep up with Mr. Stone. At the far end of the garage, he turned and slipped through a low doorway to a house next to the yard. It smelled of cooking rice and spices filtered through the open window. Mr. Stone kicked off his boots and walked through the door. He put out his hand. Wait there. I will call my wife. Inside I could see his big pants steaming over a stove in the corner. A boy my age sat at the table with books spread out in front of him. He rolled a pencil in around his finger staring at me. Me, shouted Mr. Stone. We have our lodger. A small woman came to the door on the far side. She wiped her hands on her apron and looked at me. He looks young. Mr. Stone washed his hands in the sink, look, working soap through his forearms. He's from the mountains, he said. The boy at the table put his pencil down. He stinks, he said. That's enough, Cam, snapped Mrs. Stone. She stepped closer to me and wrinkled her nose. Are you hungry? I nodded. She set a bowl and a spoon on the table. Eat first, then we will show you the room in the shower. Cam stared at me as his mother ladled noodle soup into a bowl. I was so hungry, I ate it all at once. I ate the one bowl once. And when Miss Stone offered another, I ate that too. Miss Stone frowned and looked at her husband. We'll have to charge more if he eats this much. I stopped eating, put my soup down at the table. I have no money to pay you, I said. Mr. Stone looked across at me. The doctor is paying your rent. The doctor, I said. Who is he? Mr. and Miss Stone exchanged glasses. Mr. Stone took a sip of water and quit her throat. The doctor is the owner of the farm. You will be working for him. He will pay me your rent before he sends the rest of your family your earnings. I, cla I clasped my hands beneath the table. Where is the doctor's farm? How long will it take to get there? Cam snorted a laugh. You don't know? Miss Stone wrapped her spoon down at the table. Cam, eat up. It's nearly t bedtime for you. You have school in the morning. Miss Stone led me outside in a 
her iron shed beneath the garage. She pushed open the door. This is your room, she said. The shed was dark but smelled clean inside. A shaft of light cut through the high ceiling of the far wall. She pulled the corner, lit the room with a bare light bulb in the ceiling. The room was empty except for a mattress, a small cupboard, and a table in the corner. She pressed a towel into my hands and nodded towards the shed she'd popped up against the garage. You can use the shower Mr. Stone's workers used. There's a faucet on the wall inside. Turn it all the way on and the other for off. Make sure you don't waste water and leave it running after you shower. I stood there clutching the towel in my hands. Towel in my hands. Miss Stone put her hand on her hip. Any questions? Where can I find the doctor? Miss Stone turned to leave. The doctor will come for you in the morning, she said. Her face softened. She pulled her hand from my arm. Make sure you are ready for him. I closed the door and listened to her footsteps fade away. My room was small, but at least it was a, a space for now. It was my space for now. I had a place to eat, a place and sleep, and a job with a doctor who would send money, my money, back home. I pulled the light cord off and on, off and on, a moth battered across the light bulb. I tried to imagine her home in the village with electricity. I imagined it lit up like the city. I pulled the cord on and off and stood in the darkness. Outside, the sky had darkened. The orange haze of the street light filtered through the high window. I listened to the sounds of the city light, city night, car horns, a siren, truk truk, motorbikes buzzing along the road outside, music pumping from a car, shouts and laughter. I pushed the table beneath the high window and climbed out up to outside. I could see Mr. Stone taking to a driver beneath the floodlights of the garage yard. Beyond the road and the dust clouds stirred up the wheels of traffic lay a long, low concrete building. It was the windowless except for narrow openings just beneath the flat iron, flat roof. Next to the building, tall metal gates were firmly closed and locked with a thick chain and padlock. In the evening, I would strain my eyes to make out the image painted out in the gates. It looked like a bear, a moonlight, but it seemed so strange. Out there, somewhere inside the building, a hard white light flickered, and it was the hardest darkness seemed to grow darker. I shivered. Beyond the building were more buildings going on and on. Nowhere could I see any green, not even a shrub of grass. Tam! The light flickered on. I splung around to see Cam holding up a clean t-shirt and shorts. Ma said you should have these, he said. He laid them on the mattress and climbed up next to me. What are you looking at? I pointed to the concrete building. What's that? Didn't anyone tell you? Cam stared at across the road. That's the doctor's farm. My ha mouth felt dry. What sort of farm? Cam took his time to answer. Tam, he said. Have you ever seen a bear? 